Let's so see. welcome everybody to the FAME Network meeting for January 9th, 2024 and Teaching for Artistic Behavior, TAB. What's TAB got to do with it? With Tiffany Marquardt and Carrie Shepker Miller. Hey everybody. Um, Tiffany and I are actually gonna keep this really, really general, um, almost like a promotion for summer, just so it's like everybody can just dabble a little bit and get their feet just a little bit wet. Um, and then this summer, if you choose to join us in June, we'll get into like really, really specific things. Um, but this is more like an introductory of what is TAB. Um, so Tiffany, what do you think? Should we just let everybody chime in as there's questions or it's yeah, a really small have, group? Yeah. If you have questions, I would just say, yeah, put a hand up like, or, you know, so, cause yeah, this can be more of a Q and A as well as, cause we're going to talk about a lot of, um, yeah. a lot of the structures, routines, the whys. And then of course, some of you have already dabbled in it. You might even have some, some ideas that we don't have. hundred so. percent. Yeah. Share how you do it. We do that all the time. Um, mm -hmm. and typically you watch, can you watch the chat and everything and make, like, yes. okay, cool. So that we can catch anybody choosing to interact that way. Um, I started my tab journey because I had a parent who said, how do you offer expression? And she was an artist and her husband was an artist and my, and then they had this, of course, incredibly talented daughter. And my brain was like, Oh, um, just started going and going and going. So I found my people, I found tab and I was lucky enough to get to attend the very first tab Boston Institute. And, um, this quote was led a lot of our workshops and a work of art, which does not begin in emotion is not art. Um, and as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, oh, like, and I felt like I hadn't been serving children for a really long time because of the way that I had been teaching. So like my whole world like exploded. Um, and I, I mean, I eat, sleep, breathe, live tab every single day. So, um, you know, stop me if I, <laughs> if I start to ramble, I love it. Um, okay. So this is pretty much the end all be all of all tab literature. This is the very first book that Catherine and Diane wrote. They've written multiple more. There's high school level books, really, really wonderful texts. This is my favorite because this one really explains everything like step by step, word for word. Like this is, um, if you haven't ordered this from Amazon, it's a really quick read, really lovely, um, but really, really spells everything out if you're just starting your journey. And there's an updated version available. Yeah. Um, and Tab St. Louis is in the second one. So street yeah. cred. <laughs> um, so what is Tab? So Tab is super, super simple. Um, the students are the artist and the classroom is you. And you're offering real um, time, real space, real materials for them to explore interests and for them to make choices and for them to follow their own passions, just like you got to do as a studio student in college where you got to make all of the plans. Only you're doing this with um, really, you know, younger, younger students and you're letting them really find relevance and really find their why as opposed to teaching in a more DBAE format. And you tell us what DBAB stands for? DBAE, uh, discipline-based art education. Oh. Yeah, the discipline base would be just kind of like what it's what I was taught, you know, when I first went through college, you know, if we're going to talk about um, line variety, everybody in the class does the same exact lesson on line variety. If my idea is to draw flowers with like little patterns inside of each petal or something, then that would be DBAE. If everybody's artwork comes out looking pretty similar. Um, and even there could be variety in that, but that would be more DBA. Whereas in tab, you still may teach a, which we'll get into this later. You still may teach a, a mini lesson on line variety and show how artists use line variety in their artwork. But as the facilitator, you show sculptors who are showing line variety, collage artists, um, printmakers, and, and you show how artists show line as like, a, a technique in their artwork. And then as the students then kind of go off into their own studios, um, then they can kind of hopefully that'll give you some talking points as you walk around like, Carrie, you know, tell me about your drawing today. What, you know, what are you, you know, if we're talking about the mini lesson earlier, how are you showing line? If that makes sense. But yeah, go Carrie. 
So the, your art studio will be divided up into centers. I like to call them studios in my room. I think it makes the kids more feel like artists because they have centers in their elementary school classrooms. And I feel like it takes away a little bit of um, the artist in them if they call it a center. So we really try to call them studios in my room, but they're usually divided by medium. So you'll have a painting studio, a drawing studio, a collage studio, um, but different areas of the room for them to choose to work in for the day. And they'll go to that space. They'll make a plan. They'll create, they'll reflect. It's a, it's just a more authentic art experience. Um, this photo here is I introduce all mediums up front. I front load all of my content and my kids have sketchbooks. So this is one of my second graders working with all of the drawings that will originally be offered in the drawing studio. So they'll have crayons, pastels, Sharpies, regular pencils, regular markers, but just they have a variety of materials. And I teach how each material works and like what it's capable of instead of teaching like um, directional coloring. And then we all have to make this XYZ design, I teach, oh, well, a Sharpie can color over other things. Oh, well, I can't erase a Sharpie. Oh, well, I can't mix Sharpie and colors, but I can mix pastels and I can smear pastels with my fingers. So you like teach what the medium is capable of instead of teaching it in conjunction with a lesson or a project. Um, so the classroom is designed so that every kiddo can pursue their passion and can join where they're ready. We'll talk about differentiation in a couple slides here, but the classroom is really the third teacher. Everything is set up and accessible for kiddos so that they get things out themselves. They set up their workspace, they clean up their workspace. Um, everything is self-directed. My little guys don't have a whole lot of um, menus or anything hanging on the walls because my little guys can't read. But when I had middle school, I would have links on the walls and QRs on the wall so that kids could scan um, references and things that they wanted to go to. Um, but with my little guys, I have a little bit less visual noise on my walls because they can't they can't read it anyway. But the teacher is no longer the keeper of the content. The kids are learning through experimenting, um, through trying new things, through talking to each other, uh, the environment in the classroom becomes the third teacher. It is not, the teacher doesn't have to deliver all of the information anymore. And so a, a difference in planning as a tab teacher versus a DBAE is like, you're not sitting around like coming up with lessons every night and trying to find, you know, um, but you do spend more time organizing your art space and refilling and restocking materials. So your time is just used a little differently than what it used to be used how you used to use it. Yeah. And it's definitely not easier. <laughs> no, if anybody <laughs> should tell you that it's in some ways, way, way, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. This is not the way to go if you're trying to lighten up your career. <laughs> yeah, um, But it is so like, it is so incredibly rewarding. Um, so like I said earlier, mediums are taught through what they're capable of instead of through specific projects. I think that's really helpful in allowing kids to be able to transfer information. If you teach them how to hatch and cross hatch in a still life, that might be the only way that they can apply that skill. They're not going to be able to transfer it into something else that they do. So if you can just teach them the skill and teach them the medium, then they can do whatever they want with those skills that you've taught. It doesn't have to be direct application to exactly the project that you're working on. Um, they aren't reproducing what the example that you've had on the board all of their ideas are coming from their own brain and their own heart and they're synthesizing everything and they're expressing themselves. Um, a big thing is that they aren't comparing in a regular classroom where they everybody's got to make the pumpkin. Um, they're comparing their pumpkin to the friend next to them and that's not fair or that's not okay. So um, them really being able to um, express themselves and you know say what they want to say. Um, every piece is different. Every kid is different. They're using their own interest, um, but they're really, they're working like artists. They're working like artists. And oftentimes, and I, this isn't like a cheerleader section, but, um, those students who in that DBAE, um, format of teaching that would not usually be recognized or celebrated in a tab classroom, you'd be amazed. Like, they will create these like found object sculptural materials that the other kids are oohing and on over. And that same child in a DBAE format may not get celebrated at all and may feel very, you know, 
uninspired. Um, so this was also a big thing that I got at my very first tab Boston was whose art is it? Um, because if you're as the adult, if you are prescribing the size of the paper, prescribing the medium, prescribing the content, prescribing the line quality, if you're giving them all of that, that's your art and it's your art pushed through all of the little bodies in the room. It's not your, um, it's not their voice. It's not their art. It's your, it's your art being pushed through them. And then as you're like, if you think about that, if you are still teaching in a more traditional manner right now and you want to start moving towards tab, things that you can do is start letting go of some of that. So little by little. So if you're going to teach, you know, go back to still lifes. If you're going to teach that instead of telling everybody exactly which materials and what size paper, start letting them choose. Maybe you're still choosing the subject matter, but you can start letting, you know, give them some choices here and there. Um, or the, you know, or if everybody's using oil pastels, let them choose their subject matter, but you can start inching your way into that because there is a letting go process that you as a teacher, you know, cause it's a huge mind, sh it's a shift of all of your thinking and everything that you've probably done up until that point. So it's not, you know, it's just, it's a struggle at first for the teacher, but it's amazing once you get there. Go ahead, Carrie. I feel like I lost a slide in here somewhere. So there's the three sentence curriculum that have I not covered? Have we not passed that yet? I guess not. I haven't said that. No. Okay. So um, this is one of the questions in that there's a three sentence curriculum for tab. And one of the three sentences is what do artists do? Um, I love this Pauline Joseph quote that they artists have to have an idea and then find the best material to express it or um, find the material that leads to an idea because sometimes they kiddos just are experimenting in your room and that's okay. And I tell my little guys that all the time, we don't have to leave with a finished piece that it's okay. Just experiment with materials and mix colors. And I had some friends today that were trying to see if, what would happen with Sharpies and chalk. And, um, you know, can I draw over this? And we talked about, well, it's going to clog the marker. So, but they were super excited about the way that it would fade out and thinking about what they could do with that fading of the material. I wasn't so excited because my Sharpies <laughs> were getting a little questionable today, but so, so I stopped it pretty quickly. However, they were exploring those materials and that's okay. They're learning what works and what doesn't work. And a lot, that's just as much learning as, um, you know, working on a finished piece. So um, kiddos take ownership of everything. You tab so that kiddos have ownership, ownership of their thinking, responsibility for their work, responsibility for their materials. Um, they learn through decisions. If you're not offering them an opportunity to make any decisions about their work, you know, they're not going to ever develop that part of their thinking. And like this here, Tiffany was just talking about still lifes. I do teach a lesson about still lifes if they choose to engage with, um, Working on a still life after they leave the carpet and go to choose their studio, they can. If they don't choose to follow the lesson that day, they don't have to. But this is three second graders that chose to participate in creating a still life. You know, they weren't forced to do that. They wanted to do that. And they're going to own that material in a much different way because they have made all of those decisions themselves. And one thing I want to chime in real quick about this photograph is I know coming from uh, my former school district was a lot busier. My budget was lower. Um, so something like this might be intimidating because you might think, oh, I can't have a draw. You know, I don't have drawing horses. I can't afford to buy, you know, foam shapes or whatever. One thing about tab that you will find is you you spend your budget differently because you don't need class sets of anything. So you wind up having a lot of extra money. And so, of course, you may not be able to purchase everything in one year, but little by little, like one year, you know, those drawing horses, believe it or not, I think they were like $125. They're not that expensive. Um, so, oh, I bought one one year and then I bought the phone. You know, it's like, so you you can sp spend your money differently, but don't don't be intimidated because Carrie's classroom is gorgeous and she has a Reggio class, a Reggio Emilia, Emilio classroom. Emilia. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, and so hers, you know, the, the design of her classroom, her pictures are all gorgeous. Um, but don't let that intimidate you because yeah, the money is spent differently as far as your budget, but you'll be amazed at how much you can add. 
Yeah. And I work in a regular urban public school. Um, I do, like Tiffany said, I happen to be in a Reggio Emilia inspired setting. So a lot of the um, emphasis in my school is put on the environment. And um, so I really, I'm super, super fortunate. And I actually don't like to host our tab workshop because my space is so beautiful. And I worry that people are going to come into my space and go, oh, I can't do this. I don't have all of this, but it's, it's because of my school is actually called school as studio is actually like the metaphor for my whole school. So um, my space is really valued by my building. So I get a little bit of a different, I have some perks that a lot of people don't have. And I'm very aware. <laughs> um, so process, I can't, um, I can't see around that. It's okay. Um, if you are offering kiddos the materials and the paper, and if you're giving them all the information and they're following project steps, they're totally not engaged in the process of art making. They're not brainstorming. They're not idea generating. They're not creating their plan. You know, they're not overcoming obstacles or reflecting or revising because you've already given them all of the um, steps to making something beautiful. So, um, they really lose a lot of the process and process is, is what tab is. And then also just to kind of jump in the process. Um, if you look at her list, like reflecting when you have DBAE, very, very rarely do you give time for reflection and artwork because everyone's is kind of the same and they're mostly just following directions. Um, so you start you start learning about your students as human beings, as artists in a totally different manner. So that's just mm -hmm. something I wanted to say. Yeah. And then real quick, Dana said that she was so inspired by seeing your classroom last year, Carrie. Oh, good. It is. I'm so lucky. I know I'm so lucky. It's really beautiful. Everybody always comes in and goes, whoa. I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, these friends here, though, so they were sitting, obviously sitting to, next to each other and being inspired by each other with these two little drawings that they have on this stool. Um, but I took this image because they were doing exactly what Tiffany said. They were reflecting and they were like comparing the drawings and talking in like a really beautiful way about what they, it wasn't like a mine's better, yours better, or being intimidated by each other. They were really having conversation about the two drawings that they had made. So um, those things happen naturally in a tab classroom. Um, they'll sit by side by side and give each other advice. And there's a lot of peer coaching that happens and, um, it's builds a really beautiful, um, classroom community. Differentiation. Every child enters tab, like a tab classroom where they're ready. I have some friends who go to, I have architecture blocks and like Kiva planks, and I have some SSD friends that that is the best place for them. And they build in there every day. I give them and SSD is our special school district. Yes. In St. Louis. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, but my SSD kids will, they build with the Kiva planks every single day and they take pictures with my cameras and they can enter in a really comfortable way for them and be really successful. And I can see all of the same skills through them building with blocks and taking pictures of their creations as I could, if they were making a drawing, I can see that they're planning. I can see that they're um, paying attention to balance. I can see that they're, um, they're stacking and, you know, creating ideas. And I can see all of the same skills happening um, with blocks as I could if they were doing a regular drawing. They can also jump in where their strengths are. I mean, we know, you know, maybe we have a kid that's like crazy about Pokemon, you know, a, a friend that's maybe on the spectrum that Pokemon, 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 but I have Pokemon drawing books. So they can sit in their space with their peers and they can get everything that they need and be successful by pursuing their own strengths and their own passions. Um, it's developmentally appropriate. I think a lot of times, um, and I was guilty of this when I taught big kids, I expected kid art to look like professional work. And that was the that was the grade of good was I wanted them to have really, really high quality work. Um, but it's developmentally appropriate for them to draw certain things and for them to slow, like a, like a portrait, like there's no eyelashes until they're six or so, you know? So every, um, we call it a scribble stage. Every studio has a scribble stage. 
and you can see them growing into each studio and then building on their skills. But it's developmentally appropriate for everybody all the way through high school, because even people often think of developmentally appropriate as like a preschool phrase, but it's developmentally appropriate all the way through for big kids. Um, anything else on there, Tiffany? Um, well, I was just going to say, as far as the developmentally appropriate, you know, the students kind of come in and they start with what they're, um, what they feel they're comfortable in strength. So whether it's Pokemon, or if you have student A who's sitting next to someone who can draw very realistically, student A might be inspired, like maybe they're going to work on shape. They'll, they'll, I'm just, I'm trying to like visualize, but they will jump in where they're ready. Like if they want to focus on something abstract to give themselves some some confidence, they can do that. And when two people are comparing artworks, it's not comparing apples to apples. So it's just, it's much easier. And I think it's better for each individual artist. Um, I always like to think about my why. Um, what, what do I want out of my kids? What do I want out of them? Um, I want to see creative thought. I want to see self-expression. I want to see materials manipulation. I want to see decision-making. I want to see them using their, uh, imagination and responding to their environment and building confidence. Um, I, do you remember the old GLEs, like the old GLEs versus now the new um, state standards, like how they were just these really minute child can draw in two point perspective. I don't think that a child drawing in two point perspective is going to build a successful child, but I do think creative thinking and self-expression, I think all of those things are going to build successful people. Um, so you have to know your why and you have to really process um, what you want out of your kids. This picture is, uh, I one of my lessons was all about artists who work with light. Um, I'm, I am lucky enough in my classroom, I have a stage um, that I can kind of close off with some curtains and I put an overhead projector in there and a bunch of translucent materials and um, they worked kids could be artists who work with light. And so they would build and take pictures with iPods and we would look at the pictures on the TV after they would um, shoot. And then I would um, like airplay them to my screen so that the kids could see what they were building. And um, I mean, you can constantly make up new studios. It doesn't have to just be drawing, painting, collage. It doesn't have to um, just be like basics. This is my light studio that I had up for about a month and they absolutely... They loved it. It was super fun. Um, it opens and tab opens you up to be able to do a lot of other things with kids. You're not standing in front of the classroom and you're not milling around from table to table, checking on everybody all the time to make sure that everybody's in the same space on a project or who's going to finish early and what am I going to do with them? That doesn't happen anymore. Um, and you can facilitate like small group work. So if you teach your lesson and send everybody into their studios, everybody's working, everybody's all settled in. Well, maybe you have a group of kids that want to learn charcoal. So you can pull them over to one table. You can do a small group lesson on charcoal. Um, it just really opens up a lot of instructional opportunities. Um, kids, you know, can come to you with their ideas and you can support just a small group of ideas. Um, I teach entirely responsively. If I notice kids in my room are really interested in something, I will keep pushing on that. We call it a thread. I will keep pushing on that thread um, or pulling on that thread, I guess, to um, expand their interest in that same topic in a variety of ways. Um, you can really build relationships with kids. You can sit down next to them and you can paint with them and you can draw with them and um, really, really have some strong conversations and some good relationship building with kids that probably and wouldn't happen if you were in front of your classroom. And if you want to like, if you're worried about like art history and things, that's the perfect time. So if Carrie's working with a group of kids and they're working on charcoal, then she can show, oh, there's this artist named Kate Colwitz and she can talk about, you know, history or, you know, and just, you can really show some of your art history references mm -hmm. and just, yeah, you do do these like little bitty, like facilitating small little groups and it's more meaningful to the kids because they can make more realistic connections to it at that time. Yeah. And I had a really good conversation with Catherine Douglas one time about that. Like if you um, start, you know, if you're mixing colors and you're like, 
oh, wow, you know who else mixes colors? Ellsworth Kelly. And then you do, you start showing him the Ellsworth Kelly pieces and his color mixing. And then that information is immediately relevant to that child. They don't have to recall that information later. That information is sinking in right then because it matters right then. It's not like recalling how to use a tool that you used two months ago on a different project. It's all right now. And they're really, really absorbing that information in that conversation with you because it. this is when it matters. Um, the social emotional growth is so huge. It's so huge because you're telling every single kid that their voice is heard and that they're valued and what they have to say matters, whether they're saying that with their voice or with their imagery, you're telling children what you have to say matters and you're telling them that it's beautiful and wonderful and things that are coming from them are really great. So um, it's, it's huge for social emotional growth. And one of the questions in the chat that just came up was about assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we're going to touch on that a whole lot today. I don't know if Carrie thinks. There is um, a slide that offers ideas, but. But one of the things um, you assess in a different way. So instead of assessing on, um, is everyone looking at this photograph? Like, you know, can this child like pull and push a paintbrush and use paint appropriately? Instead of looking at that necessarily, you can um, look at the studio habits of mind, which is one of the things I think a lot of those of us who teach tab have kind of tried to move us and our school communities towards that direction. So looking at just like the processes that artists do, is this artist persisting? Is this artist thinking creatively? Um, is, you know, the still life artists, are they, you know, using observational skills? So you just, um, you assess a little bit differently and you try to find different um I guess, indicators to assess on. I don't know if, Carrie, if you have anything to add to that. Um, I will, we'll get to, we'll get to like the slide with ideas of places to assess kind of. I do what's called clipboard cruising and I have all of the Missouri state standards spelled out on a chart. And then I have all the kiddos names from each class on there as well. And I literally, if I teach something, I go through and I make a line through the whole skill or the whole con like topic. Um, if a kid's really good at it, I get, put like, you know, a star or a smiley face. If I'm worried about a kid's fine motor, I have like a little different mark. Um, but you can see all of these skills happening all the time. So it's really easy to just kind of walk around your room and do like an overall observation. Um, the new Missouri State Standards and the, new, and the new national standards, I say new, the national ones are probably, what, six or seven years old or something. But they're really beautiful and really broad. And it's really easy to like scan your room and see children fulfilling standards. So, um, and they're all fulfilling them differently, but they're fulfilling the same standard. Like, um, I'm trying to think of one. What's a standard off the top of your head? Like, um, child mat uses materials safely. I don't know that one. I guess like reflecting on artwork. Like one of them's like reflection. Yeah. So like little, you know, you're still assessing just, it, it's just, I mean, we all know, I mean, there's, there, I guess there are some art teachers who love to assess and like nitpick on like your rubric and stuff, but it's just a little bit more flexible, a little bit more fuzzy, but you know, once you get that, I think it's more freeing once you get there because you're, it, you're assessing the kids on things that you can't always, it's not tangible. You don't have evidence to it all the time. Other than like Carrie said, your clipboard cruising, like, so your, you know, dots or, you know, check marks pluses, that is your documentation. Oops, oops, I think okay. I double clicked. Um, 21st century skills. Everybody's always looking for all of those. Exp oops, there we go. I knew I double clicked it. Um, especially administrators. They're always looking for, you know, well, how are they thinking critically and how are they problem solving? And um, uh, I mean, every day, like I said, you can just scan your room and you can see this all is of tabs. Yeah, tab yeah. is 100% 21st century skills. Um, this, I'm super, super lucky. I wrote a grant for this. This did not come from school money, um, but I wrote a grant for a rigamajig. If anybody watches Abstract on Netflix, there's a toy designer um, and her name is Kat. And she invented this really incredible, gigantic cart of wood and nuts and bolts. And it's like totally kid-friendly. Um, and it was really expensive, 
but I wrote a grant and my kids love it. And I mean, I turned around and they had built this person out of um, wood and it was like incredible. There's actually a robot dog that went along with this for a couple of days. But um, I mean, I, I couldn't predict that, that they were capable of that. It's crazy. Um, so this is my big thing. And this is what I notice every single day. Um, I worry that if I were trapped my kids in projects again, um, I have here, you might miss something. No, you will miss something like this little, this little blonde friend right here. He's in preschool. And I mean, you can see the paper in front of him. This kid can draw cars like I've never seen in preschool. His fine motor is like off the chart. These friends over here were like, they put the rigamajig wood together and then they got the ropes out for the pulleys and stuff. And they made it a fire. Like they're transforming materials in a way that I would never be able to teach them to transform materials. But the things that come out of them are so much more beautiful than anything that I could ever, that I could ever teach, that I could ever plan a lesson around. Click, there we go. Um, so Oh, you get why, right? We're kind of, did you drink the Kool-Aid yet? <laughs> and then <laughs> here's the, this is the how. These are my sweet little friends. Um, We talked about this. I think we probably need to pick up our pace a little bit here, but um, yeah. things are divided into painting, digital, sculpture, collage, um, mini studio studios or temporary studios, um, things like printmaking or clay or paper making. I love a loose part. Um, loose parts are like, like a jar of uh, washers and a jar of golf tees and a jar of pine cones and kind of like her light table similar. Yeah. And you can, that. you can leave them out and arrange them. And the, you know, actually I taught landscapes and then I left out a bunch of materials and kids built gigantic ephemeral landscapes out of loose parts, out of collections that we had in our classroom. That's a very, um, Reggio. Thing. And I would say your basics, according to Catherine and Diane um, in the books, your basics are painting, sculpture, drawing, and collage, I think are your four basic studios. And of course, your classroom, depending on what your classroom, you know, like I have a ceramic studio open right now. Um, I keep fibers open year round, but I don't know if Carrie does. Like, so it just kind of depends on your love, your passion, and your space and what you can do. Yeah. And there are two ways to design your studio. This is not in here at all, but one way is to have the studios around your room and the kids can go get supplies and bring them back to the workspace. And then the other one is for kiddos to um, go sit with the materials and those materials and the kids stay in the same workspace. One is called buffet style. Like think about going to a buffet restaurant where you fill up your plate and then you take it back and sit down or um, centers where they go and sit and stay with their material and the other people working in that material. I found with big kids, it was better to do a buffet because kids could bring the materials back and they could socially sit with the people that they wanted to sit with and use the materials that they wanted. I found with big kids that they would make a decision based on where their friends went. So they weren't really doing the things that they wanted to do because they were more concerned about um, sitting with a friend than they were about choosing the material they wanted. So just a just a veteran tip there. Well, and it also depends on your, you know, just your style too. Like if you like yeah. assigned seats, then you want buffet style. If you, you know, if that's not important to you. Yeah. yeah and, and the size and shape of your space, like your yeah. the size and shape of your space may determine how you lay things out. Um, so this is from my big kid classroom. This is not my current classroom, but I wanted to show you that a studio doesn't have to be this beautifully designed space. My painting studio when I had big kids was literally a cart with watercolors, acrylics, and tempera on it on different shelves. They got a bowl, they got a plate, they made their plate, and they took it to their space. But usually a studio will have um, like a what you need to know, artists known for the medium, maybe a QR code to some galleries of some pieces to... Um, celebrate artists work who maybe are painters, um, maybe kid examples of different things, but it's just like kind of all the materials for that thing in that one zone. Basically your, your studio artists, they will be more productive if they know where to get supplies. So that's part of your structure and your routine is like you basically have a place for everything so that the students, the artists know where to get it where to put it away and that just makes everything whether it's buffet or not it's it makes everything run smoother 
your curriculum and your lessons are going to be set up differently now. Um, it's, you know, it's not a lesson written for one skill. Um, like your, it'll be a really broad art history lesson, or like I said, an artist who use light or, um, what's another, uh, like you can talk about how artists work in a community and how they take care of their space and work together. The studio habits of mind, um, those are books if you want to um, grab those books, but you can teach um, studio habit by studio habit. A, a studio habit can be a lesson. Um, mm. like artist, uh, what do you think, Tiffany? Yeah, um, I was gonna say studio habits are definitely one thing that I have focused on as a professional because in my district we have like we have to work on professional goals. So I wanted my students to be aware of the studio habits of mine. So you know we talk about every day we talk about envision. You know what what are you envisioning for your idea or you know, how are you stretching and exploring? How are you getting outside of your comfort zone? And you can, you know, but you can teach into all of that either in those small group lessons or as a big class mini lesson. Yeah, but lessons are no longer projects. Right. But you can still, if you're really like heart cell, if you have a favorite thing that you don't want to get rid of, you can introduce it. Just be prepared that maybe only two or three kids might take you up on it and the rest of the students will go and do choice art. So lessons are approaches to media or techniques or behaviors, um, responsive observation. Like if you notice, oh my gosh, my kids cannot mix paint. My kids cannot blend with a stump or whatever you, you know, whatever kind of skills you're looking for. If you notice those aren't happening, those can become your lesson. Notice like where the holes are, the feel like things you feel like they're missing and then you can teach those specifically. Um, these friends here, I they were interested in finger knitting. So I showed a video and they sat on my carpet for a little while and they taught themselves to finger knit. And then um, these two friends went to the back of my classroom and they just sat with each other and just taught each other and talked and knitted like two little old ladies. It was the sweetest. It was absolutely the sweetest, but they, they teach each other and lessons, lessons just become very different. Mm -hmm. um, addressing art history. So I do... I think you froze, Carrie. Um, she will do, uh, oh, did she just disconnect? I think she did. Um, I think she often does art history. Like she'll focus on one artist, maybe um, pretty deep to where she does a big exhibit in her classroom or in her school, um, but not all the time. Um, are there any questions before Carrie gets back? Because I know that, you know, someone asked about um, grade cards. And so I tried to answer that a little bit. Or does anyone who's been in TAB a little bit have anything to share? Hilda. Um, I don't have, I, I've never heard of TAB before and it's awesome. It sounds amazing. I wish I, I was in a classroom like that. Um, so I'm not in a classroom setting. I'm at the Foundry Art Center. So we have different classroom, like different things we do and workshops. And this is always what I push for, like for different things. But then I hear the resistance is, well, like, can't, I know it says it works through high school, but could it work with adults? Could we have like open, I want to do something for like 55 and over. They can come in and sit down and do uh, something like that. So I would I, say most definitely. So you're in St. Charles at the Foundry, Out, the yeah. Foundry Art Center. Okay. Um, well, there are some places, like I know there's a place here in St. Louis called Perennial. Um, it's all recycled stuff. So it's a kind of a different theme. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's like you can have kind of like, you know, have a fiber studio over on one side with like, you know, if you're doing adults, like maybe sewing machines, embroidery threads, hoops, embroidery hoops, and just um, like um, a lot of just little examples of the things that they could make so that they could look at like, oh, maybe I want to do that. Um, QR codes are great. Um, I don't really know how to knit, but I have QR codes for my fifth grader so they can get an iPad, they can go to the QR code. Um, and then it goes to a video on, how, you know, I found some like kind of kid-friendly basic videos. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you totally could do it with adults as well as children. Like we have classes that um, we're t we do like, you want a painted snowman, but then there's an example of a painted snowman. And I just, but then they said, well, a lot of people that if they're not artists, they need a beginning spot or people need instructions and and I'm like, it's killing creativity. I mean, right. It's, so it's a constant fight with me. So you're speaking my language. 
I'm just trying to see. It's very different. Like, you know, there are those like paint your, those like wine and painting nights where oh. everybody goes to paint a snow. <laughs> And this is a totally different, and it's it's a yeah. it's a mind shift for the instructor, but for you're dealing with adults, like they want to know how to do like a dog yeah. and pony. They want to do a trick, yeah. you know. You're not yeah. teaching tricks; you're teaching yeah. the process. The process. Um, yeah. One of the questions was, um, where can someone receive tab training? Well, the book um, in the very beginning, of course, you know, I would highly, highly recommend um, Catherine Douglas and. Um, Catherine Douglas is her name and Diane Jackwith. Um, they both have, you know, the main tab book, which is kind of like, you know, it is great. If you are an iPad person, there's another book. I'm putting these on the, on the chat. There's another book called Choice Without Chaos. And that is by, um, I can't think of her name right now. She actually has since retired, but um, her book is an interactive book. So if you have an iPad or a Kindle or whatever, hers is cool because when you when she tells you something, she'll often have like a video link so you can watch students in the process of it. Um, and that's pretty amazing. Um, and then Diane Jackwith, who is the other person that writes with um, Catherine Douglas, she also did a book with the Harvard Project Zero, which is the, um, I talked about studio habits of mind. Those are the eight studio habits that Harvard Project Zero came up with that all artists, whether you're a dancer, drama, music, um, visual arts, they go through those processes. But anyway, Diane Jackwith has one specifically for visual arts. Um, but there's a lot of other, um, if you do social media like Facebook, there's a tab, like there's our Facebook page, um, but there's some tab Facebook pages and then Mighty Network. I don't get on it as much. It's, I think a lot of people politically had wanted to get off of Facebook. So the Mighty Network is another venue. It's another social media site that Diane Jackwith and Catherine Douglas monitor because they used to have a Facebook page and then they kind of got overwhelmed because there was just too much activity on Facebook. So they had to go to something that was a little bit, um, yeah, Ann Bedrick, thank you. But they had to go to something else. So the Mighty Network, look for the tab, Teaching Artistic Behavior in that way, because Catherine and Diane are still there and they will like, it's awesome. Like Catherine is on her computer all the time. So she will answer your questions. Um, Carrie, myself, we have some cohorts with our St. Louis tab. We allow, um, if you ever want to come visit or um, observe, you are welcome to come observe any of us and visit. If you want to email one of us, my my email address is all the way at the top. And I can work, like sometimes if someone comes from out of town, like we've had people from Cape Girardeau, from Kansas City, what they'll do is they'll contact one of us and tell us what they want to do. And then I will then talk to all the other like, solid tab teachers here and we'll come up with a schedule for you. So you could spend like maybe half a day to see my, my big kids, fourth and fifth grade. You can go to Carrie to see her little kids or my cohort, Abby, who's middle school. Abby is amazing. If you have not, if you don't know who Abby Berhanu is, she is, um, she's in my district now, but she's phenomenal for the middle school people. I would just, even if you're an elementary teacher, go see Abby. She's great. Um, but yeah, so we will help you with observations. We do a summer workshop. Um, so that can help to train, you know, to do more training. And some of it is just, I would say just, it's so, I know like you're going to have a million and one questions and we can try to answer, but until you take the step and just change your space and your thinking, you know, it's, you just got to get there. Uh, well, we're waiting for the next one. I'll just hop on and yes. um, tell you something that I observed, Hilda. When I was in Carrie's classroom, there was a student in the in the painting studio, and they kept looking to Carrie to say, can I, is it okay if I do this, or can I do that? And they were asking questions, and these were like maybe a first grader, maybe a kindergartner, who just had already embraced that culture of somebody tell me what to do, somebody make sure it's okay. And if you are working with 60 plus people, they have often been ingrained then for six decades in somebody tell me what that it's okay to do. So it's really an ideological mind shift as well to say, 
here are the tools, here are a few techniques, go play. There aren't any rules other than clean up when you're done. <laughs> well, and the thing that I say to kids, like even today, I had a first grader at the end of the day, Ms. Margaret, can I? And I'm like, well, who's the artist? That's always my response. Who's the artist? And they're just like, kind of look behind themselves for a moment, but like me, I'm like, yes. You, like if you want it brown, you make it brown. If you want, you know, it, like it's, you're the artist. Like I'm not here to tell them if I see them going to a direction where I think they might get close to failure, then I can help. Like, oh, if you're trying to paint a snowman, but you've you got dark black paint on your brush, what are your thoughts there? What are you trying to, you know, just sometimes you have to help, but. This summer we are planning in early June um, early ish June, um, another tab STL workshop in St. Louis. It will be a two day workshop, basically from around nine until two or three. Yeah, each it's usually day. nine to three. And it's going to be in at least two different classroom locations. And we're still working out the details because there are many things from checking with local school calendars and and checking people's schedules to find all that out. But please visit the website for the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education under our program tab for tab STL. We know that's going to happen. We've also been hearing that there's a desire for tab to be on the road, to, that tab could be in other places across the state. And again, we haven't had, those are not as firmly planned, but we're certainly open to discussing them with you. If there's a cadre of folks down in Reed Springs, who you think we could uh, plan something in the Springfield, Reed Springs, Branson area and bring enough people together, we would be very interested in having Tiffany or um, Carrie or some of the other colleagues take a road trip and come on down. Definitely. And there are some other, um, yes, if you go to like, there are like, there's a tab group in Kansas City. There might, I don't know if there's one in Southern Missouri, but there are some tab teachers out there. So. Yes. And we would love to get all of them connected in Missouri because just like other artists, you get inspired by what, you know, problem T Tiffany has with a certain studio and how did she solve it? Ooh, I'm going to give that a try. Um, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this is it takes the art of teaching visual arts and you as teachers become artists in the delivery of your instruction. Thank you, everyone. If you yes, thanks everybody for coming. Thank, thank you, you, Tiffany, and thank you, Carrie, in absentia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are delighted that you shared your expertise with us. Oh, here Carrie's back. So but that's always the toughest one. Right. But it's completely doable. And, and try to get her just make one board. comment about the difference between assessment and record keeping. Because yeah. assessment happens with that example with the snowman with the with the black paint on the brush and that you see and you observe and you coach and that's maybe not something that would go in the grade book right and so they're they're very they're they get lumped together because they're related but there's assessment that happens beyond record keeping and then there's some great tab tips that i've seen carrie use for record keeping for example um one of the things that she has in her sketchbook at the beginning is a color code for which studio they've selected. And so they color in the, let's, I'm gonna make it up, yellow is painting. And if she looks in mid semester and the kid is nothing but yellow, then she's gonna to, uh, coach them to say, maybe you'll try the a different, maybe you'll try digital, maybe we'll do sculpting, maybe we'll do something else so that they, they gain in their experience. Got your back, Carrie. Yeah, I'm glad there was only a few slides left. I'm on my phone. My computer just like died, like just died. And it's not out of power. It just turned off and would not come back on. <laughs> um, And I told people to reach out to me. They wanted to maybe get a copy of slides. And I told them that we could help them with uh, observations if they wanted to come and observe. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And really, the um, Phyllis and I have talked a couple times about like, taking the show on the road and doing like a Springfield workshop or a Columbia workshop. But really the strength of our workshop is that everyone gets to see the space mm -hmm. and we invite our students in to walk around and 
like actually do like a, a mini lesson and a little demo to so everybody can see how kids move in the studio and hear some of those conversations. So um, obviously we can't take students with us to a workshop and we can't take our classrooms with us. So it really is um, best if everybody comes to St. Louis, if you can just take two days in June and um, come hang out with us. It's a really good time. We go to the art museum, we have a good dinner, we chat. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a really good social experience too. And when we begin taking registrations in the March, April kind of zone, that's often a great time to appeal to your district for any remaining professional development funds, because sometimes they've allocated X number of dollars to go one direction and they might have an extra 50 bucks or an extra hundred bucks that could offset some of the costs for travel, you know, hotels or registration fees or that sort of thing. This was very helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. I hope so, Carrie. And if you have more questions about assessment, feel free to reach out and, you know, and I can help or Carrie can help. Thank you, Cynthia, right. as well. And thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> thank you. Everyone else. All right. Bye, everybody. Stay tuned for more tab info.